questions in the homework of chapter, chapter four. So this is just another way of proving two variables are independent. If you go back to our original formula, and now I use f and y or m and y. Let's use a and b. A refers to any variable, b refers to any other variable. They one from the rows, one from the columns. And the formula says p of a given b is p of a and b divided by the given information, which in this case is b. Now, if a, now, if a and b are truly independent, let's start out by assuming the two variables are independent. Let's say that that happens to be the case. What's another way of writing a given b? If a and b are totally unrelated to each other, what's another way of writing p of a given b? One way of writing it is a and b divided by b. What's another way of writing it? Easy. You especially should know the answer. Uh, the other way around. What? Why? Why should I know? Wait. Because you, it's the same thing I asked you before. Oh. Namely, if A and B are independent, what's another way of writing A given B? If A and B are independent, what's another way of writing A given B? Can you write it um, P of M and... No, 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 no. Sorry, it's it's got to be something... No, no, no. It's got to be something simple. That's why I'm going to cut you off right away. Oh. All right. No, no. P... A or P of B? No, no, no. It's P of If A and B are independent, then P of A given B, that's because that's in fact the definition of independent. It's got to be the A by itself. In other words, the given information is irrelevant, so they've got to be the, the A by itself. Not much of okay. So the answer is simply P of A. So, so what's another what, So therefore, we can say this is equal to P of A. Let's bring it up over here. In other words, a given B, we know by its very definition is A and B. That, that's not a question. This is the definition of this vertical line. You put them together, you divide it by the B. But if we also say further that A and B happen to be an example of two independent events, then the B is irrelevant, so let's put down the A by itself. So P of A, this left side of the equation could be A by itself. The right side of the equation doesn't change. So let's, so let's put it over here. Now, you're allowed to, anybody recall from, I don't know, sixth, seventh grade, cross, cross multiplying? You, you bring something on the bottom of one equation to the other side by bringing it on the other side on the top. So we can, have it, we can write one further statement, P of A and B is equal to simply P of A times P of B. I don't think I presented that, that as clearly as I could have, but the bottom line is if two variables are totally independent, which means P of A and B equals P of A, and P of A and B equals P of A and B divided by B. It means the two things can be set equal to each other. And by simply bringing it to the other side of the equation, we develop a new formula, which happens to be an easier version of the formula, which says that if A and B are totally unrelated, they're truly independent, and you want to figure out A and B, you calculate P of A times P of B. Now, does this formula work all the time? No, it only works if the A and B are independent. That was our assumption at the beginning of this calculation. If they're not independent, then of course things get more complicated. But if they're truly independent, a and, like for example, if you're rolling a coin, flipping a coin, the chance of a head is a half. And you're rolling a die, the chance of a, a three is one out of six. What's the chance of doing both at the same time of getting a head and rolling a three? Well, the chance of a head is a half. The chance of a, of a three is one out of six. So it'll be a half times one out of six, which is one out of 12. So the chance of getting both of them happening at the same time is, is the coin and the, and the, and the is the coin and the, the, the die independent? Yeah, they don't know about each other. They can't affect each other. So the answer, you're allowed to multiply them. Now, this formula works in both directions. If you want to prove independent, if you can show this calculation is true, you've proved independence. That's the point that I'm trying to come to, that if you want to prove that they're both true, you just, no, let, let, me, let, me, let me make the drop clear. Let's go back to the original question. Are the sex variable and the finance major variable independent? Well, we did, we had to, did it by a common sense method of getting ratios. We did it by this conditional probability method, which we did over here. Now I'm telling you a third method. You say you try to prove that the A and the B can be decomposed into the A and the B simply multiplied. If it turns out the answer is yes, that proves they're independent, because that calculation was based on the assumption of independence. Let's apply that formula. Applying it in our particular case, What's the A and what's the B? Well, it's up to you. It could be the M and the Y. It could be the F and the Y. It could be the M and the N. It could be the N and the F. You pick a pair of letters. Obviously, it's easy to pick the first row and the first column. So try to prove that males and 
finance majors equals, I'll put a question mark at this point because we don't know if they're equal, that's what we're trying to prove. Is it simply the chance of a male by itself times the chance of a finance major by itself? There can't be anything easier than that. What is male and finance major? We did that again last time, we went over it before, 48 divided by 100. Again, everything's out of 100 here because there's no, no, no conditions. How much is M by itself? That's 60 out of 100. Now what's the chance of a finance by itself? That's 73 out of 100. Now when you multiply 0 0.60 times 0 0.73, do you get 0.48? Let's do it. How much is 0 0.60 times 0.70? Well, 6 times 7 is 42, so I've got like 44, 45%. Can somebody please do the calculation? Again, it goes without saying, well, I'm saying it, everybody should bring a calculator to class just to stay awake and to participate and to know what you're doing. I hate when people come to me in the test and say, here's my calculator, I don't know how to use my calculator. So, tough luck, I mean, but now you start using a calculator. Okay, yes? 0.44. 0.44, and what about 48? This is, of course, 48. Now, are the two numbers the same or different? Well, they're close, but they're not the same. So, since they're not the same, what do we just prove? <coughs> that the two variables are independent or dependent? Because they're Thank you. David? We just prove, no, no, what do we just prove? Independent or dependent? Dependent. We just proved dependence. Remember, if they're exactly equal to so the 10th decimal place, then they're independent. But if they were slightly different, then the answer is dependent. They're not equal, therefore dependent. So again, you have three choices. I think this last choice is probably the easiest, but you can do any one you want. And there'll be a series of homeworks in the chapter to ask you to prove that two sets of data are independent or dependent. Now, just to remind you, there were two kinds of homework for those of you who haven't looked at the homework yet. There are some homework where they give you the chart on a silver platter, and there are other homework where they actually give you a paragraph and they'll tell you in English, like 48 males are both finance majors, etc. and you've got to sort of create the chart on your own. That's slightly more, more uh, challenging, but after all is said and done, you start out with a chart, and all the problems of the chapter are easy, either ask you to find the simple probability, the joint probability, the union of two events, you know, A or B called the union of two events, um, or the conditional probability, and finally, using the conditional probability to prove that two variables are independent. That's everything you need to know out of chapter four.